the officer ended up shooting. And one of the days I'm driving him home and he says, now when I get on the turnpike, I'm going to see John Smith in my rearview mirror. And for the officer to tell you that now I have to see the subject that was killed in the rearview mirror, how did you take that? Stigma, mental health, seeking help. For those dealing with their anxiety, fear, trauma, the effects of everyday life enhanced by police work. Today, we're going to take a look at the job of police work, the ex on duty experiences that police officers and command staff level administrators deal with, are exposed to, and hopefully we'll dig into the conversation of the stigma and why is it that so many struggling are failing or have a resistance to seek help when we know we're not alone. I am Robert Asensio, and directly to my right at the end is my partner, retired police chief and military historian, David Magnuson. How are you, brother? Doing great. How about yourself? Oh, man, I'm doing good. Nice. And between us, we have Mario Knapp, retired Miami-Dade police major. Yes. Who now is running for county sheriff. But this conversation is about his on-duty experiences with this issue of mental health. Mario, let, let's let's get right into it. Yes, let's do it. So, so you had some experiences. You share with us a particular story about an officer that was involved in a SWAT call out, I believe. Yes. It was a sh shooting. It was a justified shooting. But they wind up doing what most people can't even imagine. Right. Taking the person's life. An offender's life. Yes. A person who was a threat not just to the officer, but had already committed a homicide. And yet, the officer who takes a shot experiences mental health issues and the stigma of seeking help. Can we talk about that? Yeah. Let's get right into it. Yeah. So I think uh, so. It's important that the the this was a particular call out where there was a a barricaded subject inside of a house, and the officer in question is a senior person. This is a senior person who has previous experience with shootings and everything else, and that becomes important because. This was not a rookie. This was not somebody that you could easily identify and say, okay, this is going to affect him. This is a really experienced SWAT operator in a full-time team like Miami-Dade. And uh, I won't talk too much about the incident, but I will say that it was a very close quarter shooting. Um, the, the bad guy, every time he fired his weapon, what was visible to the officer was the muzzle flash only because it was a really dark environment, very, very close. The officer ended up shooting. Among with uh, you know among other officers, the the moral of this story though is that months later our team would always get together. You know we had our team night and we would always kind of what we would call uh, you know we would decompress together as a team, and it's really important in that in that environment. And one of the days I'm driving him home, or I'm driving him back to his car, and he says to me, "Yeah, you know when I get when I get on the turnpike now, I'm gonna see and I, pardon me, I forget the subject's name." but let's make it John Smith. And he says, now when I get on the turnpike, I'm gonna see John Smith in my rear view mirror. And I look at him, I'm like, you know, talk me through that, like, what do you mean? And so on the turnpike, when it's nighttime, every time you pass under one of the, the lights, the light fixtures, what happens is the car illuminates. And every time the car illuminates, he says he would look in the back of his rear view, rear view mirror and see the face with the grimace simulating the muzzle flash of the fire of the of the firearm every time he shot and that's what he sees all the time in his rearview mirror and so i said to him i said man why don't we you know why don't we go to psych services you know we, we have a psychologist you know go over there and speak to uh to to the doc dr allen at the time and his response to me was are you crazy no if 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 the team finds out that i'm going over there they're going to think there's something wrong with me and i'll lose my position and so that's really, really important and, and, and especially to talk about in this industry because we have that stigma, right? And, and officers think that they're going to be negatively affected just by showing that they need that level of support. So one of the things that I did years later when I, I, I was the use of force subject matter expert for Dade County, so I wrote a lot of the policies. But one of the policies that we threw in there was 
that if ever you're involved in a high profile incident or a shooting, it used to be that the officer had access to, but on a voluntary basis, to the psychologist. But we wrote it in a way that now the the officer is mandated to go. And the reason why is because I feel like it gave the officer, it would give, in this particular case, the guy that I'm talking about, it would give him, it would allow him to save face. It would give him that umbrella to be able to say among the members of the team, if he has to say, ah, I have to go to that you know, psychologist, ah, I don't need it, but I have to go, it's policy. And he can go in there and cry his eyes out for three hours if he needed to be, if he needed to. So it was a way of removing the responsibility from the officer having to go, but getting the help that he needs in a way that he can still kind of hide under the cover he or the she. umbrella. He or he she, she, of course, right. David, you talk about this all the time, brother. You talk about breaking that stigma. Well, you know, we're talking law enforcement, but mm -hmm. take law enforcement out. Didn't we have conversations about airline pilots? Yeah. Same thing. Oh, I'm not, I can't go because they're going to ground me. Uh, a number of and a number of occupations. Right. The stigma, you know, transcends all occupations, especially high liability. Right. We can a high trained uh, thing. But there's something you said too. You talked about decompressing as a team, SRT, mm -hmm. SWAT. Right. And that's great. That, that That's great leadership, right? Mm -hmm. You decompress right. together. You, What about the officers that go through things that one-man units? Right. Well, we're talking about your, your time now with SRT and being there. Mm -hmm. But think about that a minute with, with that stigma that goes all the way down to that one-person unit that's meant to think for themselves. Yeah, they get on the radio and, you know, get approval for something when they have the time and luxury. Mm -hmm. But there's nobody to get approval for for how they're feeling. Right. And... Uh, there's where my heart lays is that is that is that soldier in the street by themselves yeah. um, where there is none of this group camaraderie where you can all play off each other and then have somebody astute to say something, you know, listen, this is what we need to do. Or right. at least he was telling you the story about what he sees or she may see in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like hindsight, everything is in the rearview mirror, right? Yeah. yeah. I like to go back to the to the to the. And I have the a experience point there too. Okay, I like, like to go back to the experience about um, you know an officer who is a seasoned veteran. I mean, to be for those of you that don't know, SRT is Special Response Team, right? Yeah. The SWAT, SWAT team, the commonly known SWAT. Uh, so for for a, for a person to get even assigned to that unit, you have to be you have to meet a whole bunch of requirements. You you're not you're not the average officer. Not the average officer, and on top of that, an additional psychological exam. Because back then when we were in the team, uh, we had to take an additional psychological, uh, you know, independent of the one you took when you were hired. So these are human beings that are working in extra or extra ordinary circumstances, right? Yes. Unnatural circumstances in most cases. Yes. And for the officer to tell you that now I have to see mm -hmm. the subject that was killed in the rearview mirror, how did you take that? How well, did it impact I think, you? I, I think what, what, what made you realize or what made me realize how drastic it was is, as far as I'm concerned, that's a cry for help. Yeah. When somebody says that, because we're, we, he trusted me, we were in a, in a, he was in a vulnerable, we were both in a vulnerable position, we were not working and it was just a conversation, but imagine the number of officers that don't say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and how long did he go without saying it that finally he felt like he could? And, you know, when we when you talk about officers, it used to be and, and believe it or not, the take home car in, in the police industry changed everything because it used to be that we would we would hang out after work. We'd have if you work midnights, you'd go have breakfast and stuff like that. We do it. Sometimes we do it in the back of the station. That doesn't happen anymore when everybody goes straight in and out because they don't have to check in a pool car. They no longer check in at the, at, you know, at the station. Mm -hmm. But you said something interesting in another industry. I used to travel a lot training other police departments. And one day I, I'll never say the city and, and, but I met a chief medical examiner who obviously deals with death all day. Mm -hmm. Now, how does it negatively affect someone when this chief medical examiner one day, you know, we were having a beer and he says to me, yeah, we and my wife have it all figured out. Now, his wife, uh, she was a physician also that handles STDs. And he says, we know how we're going to go. We're not going to let this thing kill us. We're both going to take a pill and we'll go the same day. And obviously I'm sitting there going, what? I, I didn't think of this until you mentioned that. A medical examiner. And he's so affected by what he sees every single day that he made that statement. And I thought, okay, this is a little deeper than I know how to handle, especially back then when I was a sergeant at the time. 
But I think at least we're in a place right now uh, in all industries mm -hmm. where we can talk about it because it's obvious enough. For me, it's that cry of help or that desire to seek help that we resist. Right. And David, you talk about this again. I repeat it. You talk about this all the time. And how do we break away from that stigma and tell people, look, one, you're not alone. There are resources. And if you seek help, chances are you're going to do better. You're going to come out. It's brighter on the other side than where you're at right now. So we want to shed some light on that. Let, let's open up the well, conversation a little broader here. And now we talk about with our brothers and, and sisters in, in law enforcement or military, um, you know, you, it's, it's to push it out and it's to to take that leap. And, and it is a leap of faith right off the bat to talk to somebody like, like, the, uh, like the officer in the car with you, mm -hmm. uh, with the rear view mirror incident. Um, but it, you just got to hammer that away, you, you know, speak up, talk, don't keep it to yourself. I mean, again, going back to the physical ailments, how many times when we're not feeling good, we, we tell everybody. They don't even want to hear, but yeah, how are you feeling? That's always the biggest mistake. Right. Don't ask somebody because they yeah. may tell you. Mm -hmm. And they give you a whole litany of, of, of issues and ailments they have. But it's it's like you need the draws of life sometimes to have somebody talk to you about what's Open going up. on that's bothering you. Yeah, and I think that's what needs to change. Yeah. So what happens with the officer? So now, um, good points, David. Very good points. But what happens with the officer who confides in you, right? And and now, uh, the reality is that the cat's out of the bag. He has some troubles. Right. How do you deal with that as his supervisor? Is now. You go into management of the police department, right? right. You're, aspiring, you're aspiring now to be the sheriff of the, what has to be one of the largest sheriff's offices in this part of the country. Mm -hmm. That's not just responsible for the sworn personnel, so it's responsible for non-sworn right. and the community it serves. Right, right. How does that shape? First of all, what happens to the officer? Let's talk about right. that first. Well, I'll tell you what happened then. And what happened then was there was nothing I could do. I tried to encourage him to go and he didn't want to go. Um, but what I think is necessary is, is when you allow or when you have a service like psych services available, um, it can't be something where it takes too many steps for you to get there. That's why I believe that our, our peer services, our peer support and, um, and our psych services should be decentralized. They should have their office. But I think it's important that they actually be within the district and within the bureau so that they're accessible. So in the example that I'm giving you, the only reason why he told me that was because he had access to me. Had he not had access to me and we're sitting in a car together without the stress and everything else, um, that conversation would have never happened. He would have never called me to tell me he was having that issue. And that's why I think it's important that peer support programs be readily available at any time where you don't have to push a button, make an appointment, to call this person and schedule something. Because I think a lot of times all you need to do is kind of purge a little bit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Get some of like a pressure cooker, get some of the pressure out. And once they start talking, now it's easier for the for the all of the information to come out. But you're not going to be able to get that that level of trust and get them to expose themselves if you have to go through too many steps to get there. I would argue maybe at more times elapsed too, they build a fort, a greater right. fort around themselves, right. which it makes right. a good point. Right. You're talking about decentralization. You're talking about if in fact they're in inside the different areas, mm -hmm. the those people that are there to help may right. pick up on something or know it as it's happening. Exactly. So that's exactly a, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and the same goes for not just uh, like psychological or mental health, but it also goes for spiritual you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, relief also. Mm -hmm. I mean, it should be, yes, we have a chaplain, but you also have to schedule things to get there. Mm -hmm. I think that there should be peer support within the district that you can, you know, by the mailbox or by the water fountain, you know, how, how, how's everything going? Just have a regular conversation and start to pick up these little cues, you know? Um, so that's trained people that are in the staff, right? Present as part of the, the functioning body of the operation. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and people that they feel comfortable with, that they see every day, that they're not, uh, that they're not necessarily going out of their way to have the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know that, and I can reflect on my personal, my history in law mm -hmm. enforcement and even the military. Um, I don't, I don't believe we had that. That, that was not part of, those right. of us that are older, that wasn't part of our day-to-day -day operations, mm -hmm. right? Was it with the city of Miami? No. 
Or even Aflac in North Carolina? No. Well, I mean, that was a military town, too. I mean, yeah. there was accessibility because it was right ne next to the base, you know, Cherry yeah, Point, yeah. Marine Corps Air Station. And, and there was a lot of opening. But what you also saw there, and part of the monthly reports that I had to go over and look at, was uh, suicide attempts, suicide ideations, something that you didn't really see in the reports here in Miami. Uh, that was a major major concern, that and domestic-related uh, issues, violent-related issues. It was a little bit of an eye-opener. It's a different, different paradigm, so to speak, because of what took place in and around the base. And that was a higher MOS. You're talking about uh, mechanics, uh, you know, your officer staff, you had higher. It was much different than Camp Lejeune. Yeah. You okay. Do you think? Do you think back then it was less frequency, or same frequency but just underreported back then? What do you mean by frequency? Well, what I mean is I, I think we hear a lot more about mental health now than we did back then. I mean, back then we, we had this conversation. Well, I think when when you went to a hot call or whatever, you saw something, your sergeant would look at you and go, "Let's go toughen up. Let's go get back on the road." Well, you go back to the domestic violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, before the OJ incident. There was no, in the city, it was called Signal 55. If I'm now, 55 means something different. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, a, you had a separate, not just 34s anymore, the mm -hmm. disturbances, they were now broken down into domestic violence. So obviously, hate crimes, hate crimes is another thing. I mean, they're, they're rising and rising. The question was asked yesterday when, when I was doing the teaching, is it because they're being reported more or are they genuinely going up? And I just said, yes. Right. And that, that was my and that's answer. The question, right? Yes, yes, both. Yeah, right. that's the answer. Yes, both. Uh, and they're and they're horribly underreported. And I would suspect so are mental health issues horribly underreported. Whatever number you're seeing, it's it's. And I don't know what the mathematical formula would be, right. but I I would bet the bank it's far more than that. Right. Yeah, and I would imagine because it's like crime, right? There's the crime funnel. There's the the crimes that actually occur, the crimes that are reported. The crimes that the police write a report on, mm -hmm. the crimes that get investigated, then it's the crimes that people get charged for, and then now there's a, a smaller element of that of the people that actually go to jail for it. So we know that crime is much higher than what's being reported. Most of it just doesn't get reported, and, and a lot of it doesn't get investigated. But if but, all things are equal, then you can see the peaks and valleys exactly. when it's going up, if all things are equal. Exactly. That's like weight. If you're on a scale and the scale's off, it doesn't mm. really matter. So long as that you keep using that same scale, you'll right. know if you're gaining exactly. or losing weight. Right. Right. You right. just don't know the accurate amount on the pounds. But mm. you know, it's, yeah. you, you have something to base it on. So, so I wonder, where, where's the future police work and law enforcement, not all high liability, but let's call it frontline workers, right? The people right. who deal with the public. I wonder what, what the future entails for those that are confronted with trauma, right? Because right. You, you go to a scene, you mm -hmm. were the Champagne Towers, right? Yes. You were the commander. I was the operations commander. Operations yes. commander. That's the collapse of the- Surfside. Surfside. Collapse of a condominium. Mm -hmm. um, people died. Right. Yeah. yeah. And-, and Unprecedented. I mean, just watching the video just gives me chills. Right. Because you're watching the video, you know people are dying as the video as the building is collapsing. So right. you're there, commander. So how do you manage a sheriff's office? Three, four thousand sworn. About forty five hundred total. Okay. Well, actually, almost five thousand total because it's thirty two hundred plus uh, another like twelve hundred. So yeah, almost five thousand. And you serve a county of. Two, 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 2.5? 2.8. 2.8? 2.7, 2.8. That's documented. Maybe right, right. we know we have a lot of, of course, people in right. the community. But think about it. I mean, mental health is such a common part of our society. So right. so what do, what do you see the future of this topic right. as it manifests itself in law enforcement? Well, I see, it, I see it already on the way over here. I saw a video on Instagram on a post where, where it's all law enforcement personnel, uh, showing support, right? So we're at a place right now where it's a lot more public. It's a lot more, it's not a taboo anymore to even talk about it. So I think that's step one, right? Is acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. The other thing now becomes what I think is necessary, which is like I said, it shouldn't be centralized in one location where you have to drive halfway across the county to get to seek help. You should be able to receive it and at least have some level of peer support at your district or bureau. You know, and make it more accessible. And and I think that once that happens and we have it decentralized, I think the conversation now just continues to to flow better. And and you know, if they see me talking to the peer support person now, the other person, it it, it basically desensitizes everyone from that idea that this is a, a taboo, right? Um, yeah. But I I do think we're at a much better place now. Like I said, when I'm on when I'm on social media 
And I'm seeing different groups talking about mental health in both fire, police, and military. And on all of them, I think that's a, a good step. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm hearing from you mm -hmm. is, you know what? Let's not wait for them to come to us. Right. Let's let's go into their backyard a little bit and see now if it's easier for them. You know, I mean, how many times do we do things that we're going to do that if we had to go cross town, we say, ah, the heck with it. Right. Well, I mean, this is far more serious. But now you're giving them that opportunity to okay, this isn't this isn't really going out of my way, and really this is something I want to do. Yeah, let me talk to you. Right. So that's a good proactive approach, I think. I mean. Um, Make it easy for the person if, if they're wanting to. And now if they don't want to, and this is where the education comes in, I, I think it almost has to be constant where th there's no stigma in this. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Maybe other people that have gone through it come out and talk and say, it's okay, right. it's okay. Uh, like anything else, you have your subject matter experts mm -hmm. in, in this sense. Uh, that goes a long way. It breaks through that, that barrier that people put up. Right. Yeah, yeah I think when you, when you think of a, a rookie cop, I think that that's something that, and they they talked about it in the academy, but it was never anything that that clearly indicated to me that it was okay, right? I always thought, I mean, I remember that's seeking help, right? Right, right, um, or dealing I, with the issues. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's something that uh, that if I were back in an academy teaching day one, it would be you are eventually going to need support. This is a difficult job. You're going to say, and and just you know the acknowledgement that I think we can all make when people call the police, there's already something wrong. And it may be probably the most impactful event in that person's life. And remember that the one common denominator in all of those calls in Dade County is that the cops are always there. The police is always seeing people probably not at their best. And that takes a toll on you. Yeah. You know, and I think it's yeah. important that cops know that you from the beginning, you are eventually going to have to talk to someone. The things that you're going to be exposed to is not normal for everyday population. So get used to the fact and start, you know, uh, working in reps that it's okay to talk to someone. Well, let me let me shift to something that's really, really important. It kind of runs hand in hand here. But what about the impact, your thoughts on the impact of this anti-police mentality that, that, that seems to be growing or we don't see it as much here in this part of the county. Mm -hmm or in this part of the country, but we do see it around the country, right. this anti-law enforcement sentiment. Right. How do we bridge the gap? Well, that's one of the main main issues uh, that I think we're seeing, and that's why I asked about, do you think the frequency is any different than before? There's an 18% increase last year of officer resignations and early retirements. Mm -hmm. Officers just no longer feel supported, not by the community, not by the politicians, and not by, unfortunately, by some of the police chiefs who are stuck in a hole because they report to the politicians that a lot of times make decisions based on political uh, sensitivities instead of what, what is right and wrong. And so when you have police officers who, who are hesitating to do their own job, already, already you can add 50% stress just right there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I say this all the time, when I first became a police officer, when we used to run a three, so running lights and sirens on a priority or, or, or high profile call, I needed to slow down even on the green lights because I knew there were two or three police officers trying to get there before me. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen right now. And, it's, and, and it shouldn't be that way. But I will say this, if you have to constantly doubt, number one, you have to question what decision you're going to make here. And then you also have to question whether they're going to back you on the decision you're making and how this, what, what is the political uh, lens that this is going to be viewed uh, under. Then, you know, that's just stress. That's the uh, cops should be able to feel comfortable doing their job. If you're doing the right thing, go in there, do your job and we're going to back you. If you're doing the wrong thing, then we're going to, we're going to take it on the chin and we're going to, we're going to correct it. But, uh, the fact that cops have to hesitate so much and, and doubt their own decisions so often, I think is, is definitely adding to the problem. Thoughts? You know, you go, you go into the ring, to use a boxing metaphor, mm -hmm. which I do quite a bit. You go into the ring just to survive mm -hmm. and make it to the finish as opposed to going in there looking to win. Right. It's a big difference big in difference. your performance. Right. Now, I credit all the men and women, the cops out there, our brethren in blue mm -hmm. and brown, that that still get the job done. Right. That still get the job done each and every day. You are always going to have your naysayers. You're always going to have your people, but the the stress that they say, "Well, I'm not doing anything." Well, okay. The stress, the stressors are there though, um, 
And that's why it's so important what we're talking about, the whole realm of this of this episode, of of, of seeking out immediately, of discussing this with a professional if, if it's getting if it's getting to you, right. you know? Um, Listen, more people than not, and it's not by 5149, more people than not, by a huge difference, support the police department, support the police. You know, you're always going to have that small minority that scream the loudest, you know, and have the politicians ears, um, unfortunately. Right. And, and, you know, that being said, I guarantee you when these people have problems, they're not p calling 911 for the fire department. And I love the fire department, but they're not calling the fire department to take care of the problem unless, Lord forbid, their house is on fire. Right. Then there's nobody better than them. Yeah. You know, to show you how that compounds, you mentioned boxing and you box, right? So when yeah, a boxer yeah, goes yeah, into yeah, a ring, done. if Mike Tyson is going into the ring, he reviews video after video after video on his opponent. They come up with a strategy. That's they right. figure out what they're going to do. And they do this for months and months and months before the bout. And he knows who he's going to fight. Police officers train twice a year, and yet they have to get it right 100% of the time. They're expected to get it right 100% of the time. And in a boxing match, if you lose, you lose a fight. You know, in football, you lose a yard, you lose the ball, you lose, you know, you, know, you get sacked. But in real life, in law enforcement, you could get killed if you make the wrong decision. And yet we're held to the standard. We don't have video to review before we get to the scene. Mm -hmm. So think of how that stress just compounds, you know, and now you have to worry about how it's going to be perceived later. Yeah, no doubt. Tough job. Certainly yeah. not a job for everyone and not everyone's right. should be cut out for this type of work. Uh, we, we've come to the end of the show, but, but um, you know, I want to make a comment, then I want to ask you to tell the audience where they can get a hold of you, mm -hmm. right? If they need, if anybody wants to speak with you, yes. learn more about your platform, learn more about you and your background, uh, you know, for me as a, as a person who served and then was elected to office, I always found it horrible when police leaders became subservient to the mindset of the electeds who had no earthly clue what the job entails, but yet are dictating to the leader, the police leaders. So I, I think it's today for a person to be a police executive, a police manager, CEO of a police agency, it really requires unique leadership that can thread the needle, right? Right? Because you have to serve the public, but you have to serve your, 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 the needs of the job. I find it very, very difficult. So I commend you for even coming back into the ring to thank you. want to take on the sheriff's office, managing or running the sheriff's office. Myron Knapp, where can they get a hold of you? You can uh, go to the website. It's uh, www.marioforsheriff.com or on Instagram, it's Mario for Sheriff. Uh, we, we receive messages. I receive every single message, so you can feel free to contact me there. Okay, good deal. David, any closing thoughts? No, listen, this is an interesting conversation. Um, you know, I like what I'm hearing as the proactive approach. I think I think that's good. And uh, in your endeavors, and I'll stay away from the political realm, but in your endeavors, it seems that, you, you know, whoever gets it right. will be responding to the voters yes. Yes. in that position. And that, that's, uh, that it goes hand in hand with what you're saying when there's a little bit subservient to political leaders that, that, that wouldn't know police leadership if it, if it, if it pit them in, in bad yes. areas. Well, we can say it. Well, we can say it. No, we'll right. say it. I would have said posterior, but he said ass. That's fine. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah I, the, 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 in closing, I would just say the, this really is going to be a really, really important election, the most impactful probably in the last 60 years in Dade County. So I, I'm just, I, I continue to say, be skeptical of everything. Be skeptical of everyone. Don't listen to what I said, but don't believe what I said. Because it's very, very difficult to manufacture 27 years of leadership, administrative command, and operational experience three months before an election of this magnitude, because this is going to set the trajectory for public safety for the next 30, 40 years in Miami-Dade. So uh, do your homework and uh, choose correctly. Yeah. Whoever that is. <laughs> Votes have consequences, right? Yes. Um, so we come to the end of the show. I want to thank our producer behind the scenes, Rachel Brimage, the Miami Community News Network, Michael Grant Miller, the Miller Brothers, as I call them, thank you. But to you, the audience, we can't thank you enough. And our guest and my co-host, see you next time. Thank you.